Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for uh, coming out tonight uh, for uh, speaking up conversations about a better future. My name is Wayne Anthony, and I'm on the steering committee of the CCPA Manitoba. Uh, we'll start tonight with uh, by acknowledging that we are broadcasting from Tree One Land, the home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene people in the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, the hydroelectricity powering our computers is generated in Treaty 5 territory. The water that sustains us here comes from Treaty 3 territory. As treaty people, we acknowledge the damage of the past and the present and commit to working in meaningful partnership with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. This is the fourth and uh, actually the final session of this uh, current set of uh, speaking up um, uh, events. Um, and, uh, getting started tonight, I'd like to thank uh, the, the, everyone who's been involved in organizing uh, uh, this season, particularly Molly, Karen, and Andre. Um, speaking up is a series of conversations about a better future organized by the CCPA Manitoba. Our intention is to bring together CCPA uh, supporters and others to talk about how we can create a socially just future. Uh, check out our website, uh, www.policyalternatives.ca to find uh, all the activity of the CCPA. So tonight's uh, speaking up session, we're very pleased to have with us Amy Kraft. Um, Amy will lead us, lead a conversation about Treaty One. Um, and after seven generations, 150 years of rocky implementation of Treaty One, we need to consider what it means to be meaningfully in treaty relationships between each other and with this territory. Uh, Amy uh, is an academic and a lawyer and an artist and a change maker. Uh, she's an associate professor at the Faculty of Law in the University of Ottawa and University Research, Research Chair in Indigenous Governance and Relationship with Land and Water. Uh, she's the former Director of Research at the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, and the founding Director of Research at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. She practiced at the Public Interest Law Center for over a decade. Amy is the author of Breathing Life into Stone, Fort Treaty and the children's book called Treaty Words. In all her work, Amy's message is consistent. Respect the treaties, love the water, and stand up for justice. Um, now, just before we get started, we're going, to, uh, Andre's going to launch a poll to, to find out uh, all of us what our familiarity is with the treaty where we live. Uh, so go ahead and answer that. Um, and uh, so tonight, Amy will give us a presentation and talk to us for about 30 minutes or something like that. Uh, and then uh, we'll be breaking out into to small groups. Uh, uh, this is one of our attempts to recreate. Uh, we started this, this whole series uh, at XQs and uh, there was lots of conversation around tables. Um, and we'll invite, after that, we'll invite everyone to have a conversation with Amy. So now I'll, uh, with, without further ado, I'll turn this over to Amy. I'm joining you from Treaty One territory and in the city of Winnipeg, and I'm really pleased to see um, your names. I'd love to see your faces. So those of you who uh, wish to turn your camera on, I'd love to see um, to see your faces. And I lament the fact that we can't be in person, but appreciate um, all of those of you who are trying to keep uh, yourselves and your families safe and, and healthy. Um, I'm looking at the results of the poll here, um, and I see that most are somewhat familiar, slightly or very familiar, um, some not at all. And uh, I'd love to know who's extremely familiar with, uh, with the treaty. I think that's uh, an awesome answer. Uh, I put myself in the very familiar category because I think I'm learning new things about treaty um, every day. 
and I've been living that relationship since um, since I was a young person, and uh, uh, it's incredibly important. It is the defining um, the defining relationship that allows us to be in relationship with this territory. And when I say in relationship with, that means our ability to live, um, work, and be uh, in territory. Uh, so as I said, I'm here in Winnipeg, and hopefully one day we can cross paths on the, the street and continue this conversation. But today will be um, a warm up. And, and what I want to start with is uh, thinking about how important words are. Uh, words actually matter as much as actions. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a lawyer, and I'm certainly not suggesting that each of you needs to read the written text of the treaty as a be all and end all of the treaty understanding. But words matter in the, in the ways that they're spoken. They matter when they're associated with certain actions and they contain promises. Um, they also help us understand the world in which we live. And so, um, and, and what the world in which we live in terms of our normative obligations or our laws. And today I wanna focus on um, Indigenous understandings of treaty and the implications of that today, um, what treaty partnerships could look like, what being in a treaty relationship means for our relationship with land, as well as our relationship amongst each other. And coming back to this idea that words matter, um, you know, part of that, that understanding is actually coming from, um, from uh, this little book, Treaty Words. Um, and a few sentences that are spoken during the, the time of treaty that I'm going to refer to today. And um, we'll go back to some of the, the words spoken by um, the Anishinaabe negotiators of treaty, because I think those are important. And we have some glimpse into what those, um, what those are. I also want to underline that um, I had the privilege of, of being granted a, a research chair to continue and, and deepen the work that I'm doing um, in relationship uh, with land and water. And the, the research chair is, is called Nibiminoa Ki Nakunagewan. So uh, the English translation of that is um, indigenous, law, uh, indigenous governance in relationship with land and water. And some of you will probably question the grammar, <laughs> um, but it actually is in relationship with land and water. And it's not about or of or on um, it's in relationship with land and water as beings uh, that we're in relationship with, that we have kinship relationships with, and that have um, uh, autonomy and agency and uh, ways that uh, other legal systems and Eurocentric thought don't often accommodate for. So that's kind of the place that I'm coming from in terms of, of understanding is that we have these dynamic relationships with the environments that we live in and it's not about um, us looking at what's external to us as objects but subject of our relationships. Um, one of the other things that is important to uh, disclose in terms of the the treaty relationship as I see it is that treaties um, are the source of legitimate settler presence in our territory. So right now, I think many of you are in Treaty 1 uh, territory. And without Treaty 1 that was made 150 years ago, so seven generations ago, um, there would be no legitimate settler presence in the territory. And I think that's very important because A, um, it's, it underscores the significance of the treaty and, and honoring the promises. But it also reminds us that without the treaty, or if we think of doing away with the treaty, then where would settlers be? Where is the return to if there's no legitimate settler presence within this territory? I think that's a very humbling thing to remember is that we, if we think of voiding treaties or starting over in terms of renegotiation, it puts settler peoples in a very precarious position in terms of um, you know, where, where to call home. Um, I had a very interesting conversation today with a colleague out on the West Coast, and I shared that my, um, my pet peeve, um, I have a few, but <laughs> the one I shared today is um, when we are talking about um, surrendered territory or unsurrendered lands, 
And in my view, um, there are no surrendered territories. We're in a space right now in Treaty 1 of an agreement, a uh, place of an agreement to share. So we're in shared um, shared territory. And that's what the treaty promise is, is to share in territory. One thing that's also important to um, acknowledge, I think, is that you know, words that are found in the written text of the treaty are not part of the negotiations and they don't necessarily have normative resonance or they don't apply to Indigenous understandings of the treaty itself. So I don't know if we have any fluent Anishinaabe one speakers here. I don't see anyone that I recognize that would be a fluent speaker, but um, if there are, um, you know, you would understand that the words seed, release, surrender, and yield up do not, none of them have uh, Anishinaabe Mwen translations. So those are not words that have a, an easy translation. We could probably muddle through it, but it would take us long explanations to try and understand each of those terms. And there's actually no um, written record, there's no account of those words ever having been brought up or discussed in the treaty negotiations. But they do show up in the written text of the document and they find themselves to be sort of the cornerstone of Canada's interpretation of the treaty. So seed, release, surrender, and yield up do not correspond to words that were spoken, words that were defined and understood and translated into Anishinaabemwin. And they also don't align with um, the normative values and Anishinaabe legal orders that helped make the treaty itself. And um, I think it's it's also important to, to note that, that I'm coming from the perspective that Indigenous laws are helping to inform the making of the treaty and that they should inform how we understand, interpret, and implement treaty relationships today. Um, so all that being said, if we were to go back, and this, this would be my dream, would be to return to the negotiations and have a better understanding of what was discussed over the nine days of, um, of conversation and, and negotiation at the Stone Fort. One of the things that's really clear, though, is that there are uh, Anishinaabe laws, both procedural and substantive, that are at play during the whole of the treaty negotiations. And so if we were to set a stage and think about what, what did this look like? What did the treaty negotiations look like as, as the beginning of our understanding? One thing is that there's a, a commissioner's party that comes um, to the, the fort to negotiate. And there's a set of instructions that are given to uh, the commissioners to make a treaty. The, those are what end up being the paper that's signed, but that's not a reflection of the text of the treaty. So. Imagine, you know, entering into nine days of discussion. Let's let's use your significant other or one of your children or your one of your siblings as an example. Nine days of, you know, negotiation about how you're going to share something. And then to have a document that was pre-written by one of you be the the the, the binding contract that's signed at the end of it. Um, that doesn't really resonate very well with anyone, I'm sure. Um, and we need to really take seriously what was discussed in the uh, in the negotiations themselves, and what the normative values are that um, that underlie that. So there are a wealth of oral promises that were made in Treaty One that don't figure in that written text. There's a renegotiation of Treaty One four years after the fact, or three years after the fact, um, and uh, reconfirmation of what the treaty promises that were supposed to be included, directly included, um, the, sorry, they were included in this, uh, this renegotiation in, uh, in the um, additional promises. They were actually written down at the time of treaty, but not written into the text of the treaty. So they were added um, after the fact. And there's a lot in terms of the oral promises that don't make their way into any version um, of the treaty itself. And that's, Kind of where I think that we've started to depart from the intention of, of the treaty. Um, are there any lawyers in the room? I don't recognize any. Um, and you probably wouldn't want to say so. No one ever wants to say they're a lawyer. I am. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is, it, it could be considered to be an unconscionable agreement um, to, to think about the treaty as. Um, 
you know, not a reflection of um, the normative values at the at the time, and not a reflection of the the oral promises that were made. So a written text that doesn't reflect the the true intent. Um, the other reason I was asking if there were lawyers in the room is that lawyers have a good sense of how the law kind of um, helps us and hurts us in in some ways. And one of the ways I think that the uh, Canadian common law has taken treaty interpretation in, in a bit of a sideways direction is uh, the idea that was introduced by the Supreme Court of Canada that what we would strive to do in a contemporary context is to find the common intention between the parties. So what the court says is if you want to understand treaties and interpret them properly today, you have to find the common intention at the time of treaty making. I suggest in my book and in all of the work that I do that it's okay not to have had common intention, that you can be coming from two different perspectives. And even if you agree to something, you may not have meant the same, um, meant for the same outcome. And there's a couple examples in the treaty negotiations that illustrate that. And I'll share one of them um, with you. Um, I'll share two actually, probably. Okay. Um, the first, just going to make a note to remind myself to come back to the second one. The first is the concept of mother as kin that's so integral to the making of this treaty. So without this idea that the queen, who is the primary figure of the treaty, uh, without this idea of her being a mother, I don't think there would have been treaty making. And all of the fur trade and interactions, uh, the fruitful interactions that were happening on the territory prior to treaty making, uh, we're actually on the basis of developing these kinship relationships. What's interesting is in the treaty negotiations right from the start in the, you know, the first words that the commissioners are, are sharing is that they say, hey, the queen's really happy you didn't ally with the Métis. She wants to reward you for being loyal subjects of the queen. And um, you know, when you hear our words, you hear her. She's the one giving us these instructions. So there's this, this relationship um, and both of the parties are using the terminology of mother, and they're uh, talking about uh, deep, a deep sense of equality. And I, I went back actually to the transcript. I mean, it's not a, a whole transcript. It's as reported by the Manitoba newspaper throughout the treaty negotiations and, and printed in the paper. But it gives us a sense of uh, how things were recorded in terms of the translation and the speeches made by the treaty negotiators. And um, so what the, um, the Anishinaabe uh, say is we hear um, the queen, we hear our, our, our mother, we agree to form this relationship of treaty on this basis of equality with, uh, with her children. And um, I often think of the, the treaty medal, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, the handshake that we see between the treaty commissioner and one of the chiefs. Um, that wasn't a Treaty 1 medal, it came a little bit later and it ended up replacing the Treaty 1 medal, but that idea of the handshake, I, I often think of it as the moment in time where they're shaking hands and they're agreeing to make this relationship on the basis of kinship, of mother, and they're agreeing and they, they think that they're saying the same thing, right? If I look at you now and say, you know, um, the concept of mother, we could think that it's a universal concept. Everything born has a mother. Um, everyone sort of understands a base concept of mother. But based on the, um, the worldview that you come from, the culture that you're from, and what I say is you know, part of our normative values and our legal systems, you can see the obligations that flow from that very, very differently. So that's one of the things that happened in the Treaty 1 negotiations is that everybody agreed there was common intention um, that the mother is the representative of the crown who's making treaty um, with the Anishinaabe in, in Treaty 1 territory uh, in 1871. But um, what's in the mind of the treaty commissioners when they're saying the mother, um, the queen as, as a mother? They're thinking of what is imported pretty much um, wholly from British uh, common law at the time where you have older children that have different rights than younger children, male children having better rights than female children, um, 
children not having any authority until the age of majority. Uh, we're looking at a period in time where child labor is being regulated. Um, so you don't have equality amongst the children. You have this decision-making power by parents over children. So this idea that the Anishinaabe would be subjects of the queen is um, explained through language of kinship. But as an Anishinaabe person understanding that, um, the, the thinking is quite different. It's, it's about this deep sense of equality. So parents are not above children. Children are whole persons in Anishinaabe law as of their time of birth, actually at time of conception, even prior to birth. Male and female children are treated equally as are children of a variety of different ages. Um, so there's this deep sense of equality and forming a relationship that's equal but the relationship with the mother is a special one. And it's a reflection of the relationship with, um, with land, with the earth. The earth being represented as a, as a mother figure in Anishinaabe creation stories and um, Anishinaabe worldview. So a really central role for the mother um, to look after the well-being of the child and foster their autonomy. So if we, and I just want to repeat that, to look after the well-being of the child while fostering their autonomy. So what, what does that mean in modern terms? Uh, I think it means self-determination and self-government, right? Ensuring that there are things that uh, are needed, but not treating um, in, Indigenous children as children, but as whole legal subjects in a relationship of sharing through the treaty. So I think that there's a lot of import of, uh, you know, different thinking, different philosophies, different normative values into this agreement where you're shaking hands and agreeing to build this relationship with the mother. Um, but what it means from the Anishinaabe perspective is equality amongst the children, um, not being subject of, but rather, um, being in relationship with fostered self-autonomy um, and, and self-reliance. So that gives you a very different sense of, you know, what the base of that relationship of sharing might, might actually look like. That relationship with mother and uh, earth as mother is also really significant to how the treaty itself um, was negotiated. And that's why I gave the title to this talk, um, Being of the Land. Uh, you can read that a couple different ways. And again, I want you to pay attention to words, um, you know, being of the land, to come from the land, um, but it can also mean a being, the, an entity of the land. And that idea that we're born of our mothers, that we're born of the land, is something that's reflected in the treaty negotiations in a very uh, profound way. And there's one chief in particular, um, Aita Petang, who... Um, uh, speaks often um, and apparently with great flourish and um, a lot of what he said it constitutes a, a large part of this um, this written record. Um, he advocates for um, for a few things one uh, being the release of prisoners talks about a dark cloud uh, over the treaty negotiations and advocates for their release um, also speaks to this concept the deep concept of equality amongst the children. And um, he actually gets very upset and it's, it's documented significantly in, the, in this record. He comes forward and he actually gets mad at the other Anishinaabe, which is rare. And, and I, I talk about it in my book, you know, this non-interference, sort of do what you want. We'll wait for the others to come. I can't speak on behalf of other groups. This is really integral to the, the treaty negotiation. But he actually comes forward and, and reprimands the others um, for kind of mapping out reserves before they have a full understanding of what the terms are of the treaty. And um, he, uh, he seems, I, I love the, him as a character. I would love to meet him. Um, but he actually speaks to the commissioner and they record it and he says, you know, uh, when you got up, you looked at me hard. And if I used any improper language, I didn't mean to be insulting. So he realizes that he's being controversial. 
He just wants to see, I, I want first to see what you're offering and then I'll tell you my offer, which I love also love because he's saying, this is not a one-way street. This is not take it, a take it or leave it deal. It, to me, it says there's something more profound to this negotiation than agreeing to the terms of a pre-written uh, document. And so a little bit later he says, and, and he says this, I'll tell you what I mean to reserve. So this is when they're talking about these different reserve areas. When first you, His Excellency, began to travel from Fort William, so he's speaking to Commissioner Simpson, you saw something afar off, and this is the land you saw. At that time, you thought, I will have that someday or another, but behold, you see before you now the lawful owner of it. I understand you're going to buy this land from me. Well, God made me out of this very clay that is besmeared on my body. This is what you say you are going to buy from me. I live far away where it is silvery. Where you first found me naked with the fur-bearing animals by me, I traded with a white man and saw what he got for his fur. I want to know what is to be allowed to me. And then he mapped out all of the land that he wanted to continue to control um, and, and have access to. And the response by the commissioner says, if all of these lands are to be reserved, I would like to know what do you have to sell? So an acknowledgement there right from the start that there, um, there, there is no real understanding or agreement as to this idea of selling, selling the land. Um, and, I, and I think that's really significant because later on, um, this same chief talks about, um, you know, I, if I wish not to sell it, you might just take it from me, but you can't take what I'm made of. So he's illustrating this relationship, not only of care and jurisdiction, uh, he understands the idea that maybe the crown wants to buy or purchase land, but he's saying, I actually can't sell it, I'm made of it. Um, and so that brings us back to this understanding of, of mother and kinship that is so integral to the treaty relationship. So I, I see that you know time is, is going by. We could probably spend a lot of time talking about this, but that's what I wanted to share um, in terms of the Treaty 1 uh, negotiation and how I think it sets a different, very different tone than if you're to read the written text of the document um, or the written text of the treaty. The, the thing I'd like to end on before we go into discussion is kind of what comes out of this this book. This is a, um, uh, it's not a follow-up really. It's, it's, um, it was actually a piece of fiction that, fiction that I wrote um, that uh, is called Treaty Words for as long as the rivers flow. And what it, uh, it aims to share is the relationship between a young woman and her grandfather. And it um, illustrates how treaty making how we made treaties, the things that I just talked about, how that actually was shown to us by the land itself, uh, the land and the water. And so they, the story is about them sitting, um, sitting by the river uh, and sharing about, her grandfather sharing about the treaty. Um, and it illustrates a very important, uh, a few very important concepts. So what the grandfather says to um, his granddaughter is that in the treaty we made with the queen, we had an agreement to work together. This is translated to a goi in in Anishinaabemowin. Everything we negotiated with the crown is on top of what we already had. What the queen's children misunderstood was that they thought that they owned the land and that they controlled us through the treaty. They did not respect us but we've always known that we retained our sovereignty, laws, language, and connection to the land and water and ways of being. We agreed to the treaty and we agreed through the treaty that we would live side by side. So that's the agreement um, of sharing. And he also talks about how this ability to make treaty is understood on the basis of what happens in the natural world, what happens within and on um, Mother Earth. 
And that's a reflection of the principles of renewal and reciprocity uh, and respect that are built into how the treaty is made. Um, if you look at the concept of annuities, it was discussed um, in the, the treaty um, making. It's also reflected in the written text. We've kind of taken a, a deep departure from uh, annuity payments. And I think that we should come back to that as we think of um, treaty relationships today. Um, so what the grandfather says is that the first treaty that was made was between the earth and the sky. It was an agreement to work together. We built all our treaties on that original treaty. And that's what we said to the crown when they came to discuss how we would live together on this land. For as long as the sun shines, the grass grows and the rivers flow like the original treaty. The creator also showed us how to remember by having the sun rise every day, the earth and the sky are renewing their commitment to work together. And we in turn honor that relationship and directly benefit from it. So these are some of the, um, the words that, um, that grandfather shares with um, his granddaughter in that book. Um, and so I think it's important to think now and to reflect today on you know, what that sharing relationship should look like, how we should honor uh, oral understandings of the treaty and Anishinaabe understandings, not just oral understandings, but those that come from indigenous legal orders. Uh, I often show this image and I, I'll just share my screen um, with you now to, uh, to illustrate how, um, you know, the, how it's important to take this seriously, uh, this idea that uh, the written word of the treaty is not the whole of the treaty itself. And some of you may have seen this, um, seen this image uh, already. So this is an image, one of the two surviving images of Treaty One. And uh, I often look and think, okay, who are, who are these characters? Um, how did, did this actually come about? What's interesting is the uh, Anishinaabe have blacked out eyes um, in, the, in the images. Uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, interpretive lens to have put on this image. But these were recordings meant to be true recordings of the, uh, the negotiations. Um, how many of you by show of hand have been to um, Lower Fort Gary? This is where the treaty was signed, uh, treaty was made. So yeah, quite a few of you. Yeah, okay. So that's just north of the city and that's where the treaty, um, treaty one was made. And there were participants there from treaty two as well. Aita Pepetang is actually, um, he talks about himself being from further west from treaty two territory. And a lot of the treaty two um, understanding is built on the treaty one negotiations. So when you were at the lower Fort Gary, do you recall seeing this chain of uh, mountains or hills, rolling hills in the background? Do any of you recall? Um, no, you wouldn't. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's that it's not there and it historically was not there and it currently is not there. Um, so this is an artistic license that the, um, this image has, you know, the, the author of this image or the artist behind this image has taken to add something that wasn't there. And often we refer to these two images as being true images of the treaty negotiations uh, in the same way that we refer to the text as being a true representation or even the transcript that's printed as being, um, the, it's a very slim transcript that's, that is a, a reflection of it. And um, we know by looking at this, that that chain of hills or mountains is not there, that um, we can't wholly rely on it. And we need to think about um, you know, what that, that means in terms of um, normative implications today. Um, one of the parties to the, uh, one of the treaty commissioner's uh, representatives or a witness was a man named by, by the name of Molyneux St. John. And he was a Toronto Globe reporter at the time. When he left the negotiations, he actually reported back that um, the parties had left the treaty, the Indians meaning one thing and the commissioners meaning another. 
So that coming from someone who was engaged by the Crown to report back on treaties saying they meant different things when they negotiated this has to be taken up um, today. Uh, we can't do away with the treaties because that means that most people here would be without a home. Um, but I do think we need to, to take seriously what it means to be sharing and to be of the land and be in relationship with the land and also establish and reestablish the relationships amongst ourselves um, within the treaty uh, framework. One of the things that I'll uh, you know, ask you to think about in your, your breakout rooms is the idea of who benefits from treaty. And I would say that um, you know, all parties uh, have some form of benefit, but some may have disproportionately benefit since the making of the treaty. And um, what do we need to think about today to equalize that? What does sharing mean? Uh, is it resource revenue sharing? Is it shared decision making in relation to lands and territories? Does it mean some form of equalization, like equalization payments that exist um, in, you know, between um, the federal government and, and certain provinces to uh, equalize circumstances within, within the country? And there are a variety of other um, really important um, solutions to how we, how we implement treaty today. One of them, um, and one that I advocate for on a regular basis is the recognition of Indigenous jurisdiction and participation, direct participation in decision-making, not only informing it, but um, being integral to it and having systems of decision-making that, that are Indigenous. Um, so I think those are things to, to think about and, and discuss in your groups. Um, I wanted to end with something that's not related specifically to our territory, but to an adjoining territory, and that's the Black Hills in the US. And I was just reading today, um, USA Today article, where the great granddaughter of um, the man who carved Mount Rushmore is advocating for, um, she thinks it's time to remove Mount Rushmore. Um, and so there's a, a debate about this. Some people say, well, even if it's part of a deep colonial history, it's an important reminder of that deep colonial history. And her view, it should be removed. And part of her reasoning is that, that the Black Hills in 1868, so around the same time as the treaty was negotiated here in Treaty 1, um, there was a grant by the U.S. government to the um, uh, Sioux, Sioux people, um, so Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, an absolute um, undisturbed, absolute and undisturbed use and occupancy of the Black Hills. So that was a grant that was made um, by the government in 1868. Only a few years later, uh, gold was found. There were st was starvation. There's a variety of different circumstances, but land was purchased. Um, Sioux land was purchased. And ultimately, one of those spaces that was purchased was Mount Rushmore, which now has, um, I think the figures were carved in the 1940s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what uh, you would, you know, so that's, that's one part of the debate. But if you look at it from um, the Sioux perspective, uh, which I'm not, and I'm sure it's more nuanced than I can possibly ever understand, um, the carved faces actually look to a place where um, the uh, the Sioux the that they call uh, Washunia, uh, where the earth is believed to breathe, and they also refer to the earth as a mother. And so these faces, these colonial faces, are looking at this place where the mother breathes, and so there's a lot of um, you know, a lot of what we think is purely symbolic that actually has deep meaning and resonance in terms of the spaces, um, uh, the spaces of land and water that we are on, that we are in relationship with, and that we need to um, take seriously, even if we don't fully understand them, seeking out Indigenous knowledges about, about those uh, spaces and those relationships to land even uh, indigenous names is a good starting point uh, and understanding, you know, what treaty is there, uh, you know, what treaty areas we live in, who are the people of that land, what are the different 
spaces and places of the land and water within that territory is really important if we're going to have good relationships amongst ourselves and good relationships with the lands and territories that we uh, live in and depend on on a regular basis. So I think I'll, I'll close with that. Um, and thank you, um, say miigwech, chi miigwech for your time and uh, look forward to the conversation that, um, that we'll have 